Hello. Recently I posted a video demoing a really silly thing that I did. It was a Word document that is also a terminal emulator. It doesn't have any practical purpose, I just made it for fun. If you haven't seen the video yet, then fix that now and then come back. Link in the description. This video is going to explain how it works and why so much of it doesn't work. There's three important parts to a terminal emulator. There's a parser for the incoming data stream from the program that is connected to the terminal, which determines how to update the terminal's text buffer. There's a renderer to turn that buffer into something that can be displayed on the screen. And finally, there's a keyboard encoder which takes keyboard input data and turns it into a data stream to send to the connected program. The keyboard encoder part is normally very simple. Any modern OS provides keyboard input through a convenient abstraction layer. For most key presses, the terminal emulator just passes the character from the keyboard event directly to the program. Sometimes it needs to be a bit more sophisticated though. For example, arrow keys get turned into special control sequences. The renderer part is the next most complicated part as it requires interfacing with graphics hardware. Again, modern OSs provide good abstraction layers for graphics output, but generally this part is still more complicated than input. Finally, the parser for incoming data is the most complicated part. It is, in my opinion, what defines what a terminal emulator is. If you don't do this step and just put all the text on the screen without parsing it, then you wouldn't have a terminal emulator, you'd just have a thing that displays a raw data stream. So these are the three things I need to have in my terminal emulator. Now, over to Word. I'm sure the first question some of you had after seeing the demo of the terminal emulator was, how is this even possible inside a Word document? Word documents are just static blobs of data, they don't contain code. Well, actually they can contain code. Microsoft's Visual Basic for Applications, aka VBA, is a lighter weight version of Visual Basic that Microsoft has embedded into many of the applications that they offer. It enables application functionality to be augmented by the user or by other developers without them needing to have the source code for the application itself. This is a really powerful tool for building useful things on top of existing code. In the case of VBA and Word, the code that you wrote would be stored inside of a Word document or a template file and would be available to anyone using that file. In Word, it is typically used to generate parts of documents. The classic example is mail merge, where you want to generate a bunch of letters and print them out and mail them to people given a database of their names and addresses. There is a big downside to this though. Allowing people to embed computer code into Word documents is risky. Suppose I write some VBA code that starts sending all the contents of your documents folder over the internet to a web server that I own. Now I just need to email you a Word document and once you open it, I start receiving confidential files. By default, modern versions of Microsoft Word will not execute VBA code embedded in documents. There are modern alternatives to VBA that are much safer for the user, and these are preferred instead. Of course, Microsoft doesn't want to break compatibility with older documents. Word will ask you if you want to allow macros to run. The reason why I'm using VBA for this instead of the modern MS Word extensions API is because it's far more entertaining to have a Word document be a terminal emulator than it is to have a Word extension that's a terminal emulator. It's almost too easy if it's an extension. The VBA method also means I can share just a single Word file with everyone, and it just works with no plugins to install. Okay, so now finally onto the technical details. Normally, a terminal emulator would maintain buffers in memory that contain details about the text to put on the screen. Typically there's a buffer for text and another buffer for formatting attributes. Then the rendering code takes the contents of these buffers and produces the final image you see on the screen. In the case of my Word document terminal, I wanted to use the existing rendering features in Word. Since Word already has its own internal buffers for keeping text and formatting information around, I wanted to simply reuse these. This is one of the things that I did to make the task deliberately more difficult. It's more difficult because the user is able to directly interact with this buffer at the same time as my code does. If I was maintaining my own buffers, then there would be much less opportunity for race conditions and mismatches in internal state. You see, when my code needs to add to this buffer, or rather add to the document, it needs to determine somehow where in the document to insert the new text insert it there, set any attributes on it, and make sure that the cursor ends up in the right place. It's hard to be sure if the cursor is already in the right place. The user can move the cursor in various ways. They can use the arrow keys, click somewhere else in the document, or perhaps implicitly move the cursor by deleting or pasting in text. All of these actions are handled by Word directly and not from my code. My code just has to deal with the consequences of them. In practice, the way that I deal with this problem is by ignoring it, mostly. While my code will move the cursor, if required by a specific control sequence from the program, it otherwise just allows the user to move it and inserts new text wherever the cursor happens to be. The reality is that this is good enough for most use cases, as if there are any real use cases for a terminal emulator in a Word document. This is part of the reason why Vim doesn't work very well in this terminal emulator. Vim explicitly moves the cursor around a lot, 
and expects it to remain wherever it puts it until it moves it again. If the user has moved the cursor in the meantime, then Vim's rendering logic fails. So, my terminal emulator is using the document as its buffer. This means that I get to entirely skip writing the rendering part of a terminal emulator, since Word is doing that for me. Now let me explain how I handle keyboard input. Word already does a bunch of things in response to keyboard input. One thing that it doesn't do, however, is provide VBA code with a way to listen to keyboard input events. It is technically possible to receive keyboard events from a form in VBA code, but that's not applicable here because I want this to work in the normal document pane. Since I can't receive the keyboard events from Word, I have to derive keyboard events from the effects that they had on the document. For example, suppose in one iteration of my main loop, I see that the previous state of the document was when it was 23 characters long in total, but now I see that in its current state it is 24 characters long. The document has one more character in it than it did before. I assume that this is because the user has typed a character. It's possible that they typed multiple characters between the times that I checked, and so perhaps it's 25 or 26 characters long. Regardless, I can determine how many new characters have appeared, and extract that number of characters from directly behind the current cursor position in the document. Surprisingly, this is actually quite effective. Similarly, I can detect when the document gets shorter, and I can assume that this is the result of the user pressing backspace. I can then insert backspace characters into the input stream for the connected program. I could also observe changes in the cursor position that don't correspond to changes in document length, and use those to deduce when the user has pressed arrow keys to move the cursor. In practice though, this is too complicated to be worthwhile. Naturally, the user can achieve the same effect in the document via multiple different means, so I cannot perfectly map document changes onto the keyboard events that produce them. The theme of this project was deliberately making things hard for myself, and in this case I actually made things impossible for myself. Did the user just type hello by pressing H-E-L-L-O, or did they paste in the word hello with control V. There is no way I can know. Similarly, if a keyboard action has no effect on the document, then I can't detect it. This is why I can't detect control C and send an interrupt to the program. This is acceptable, however. The benefit of writing a tool simply for entertainment purposes is that bugs that produce comically bad user experiences are actually features. Okay, so I kinda have keyboard input. It's a bit janky, but it's good enough. Now all I need is a parser for terminal escape sequences. This is the actual terminal emulator part. And actually, this is the really boring part of the whole thing. Honestly, I don't have much to say about it. It works as you would expect. The only strange thing it is doing is interacting with Word to maintain the resulting state instead of maintaining its own buffers. It moves the cursor around the Word document instead of maintaining its own cursor position. It puts text directly into the document instead of buffering it itself. Again, there's a bit of jankiness here, but it works well as an entertainment piece. The cursor doesn't move around exactly as expected. It struggles to delete the right sections of text when it needs to overwrite something that's already there. It takes a long time to complete certain actions, but it's fine. I could have spent more time on it and probably gotten Vim to be almost usable like this, but I decided to just leave it. It was entertaining already. So those are the big challenges. Now onto some strange little things that came up while I was writing this. First of all, you probably saw in the other video that Vim doesn't believe it's connected to a terminal. I joked about Vim being rude, but actually it's technically correct. You see, for historical reasons that I don't fully understand, some programs care about if they are connected to a terminal or not. Most modern OSs provide a mechanism for a program to query, hey, am I connected to a terminal? And since we have terminal emulators, the OSs also have to provide a way for a terminal emulator to tell the OS, hey, I'm a terminal emulator. If this program asks if it's connected to a terminal, say yes. So why didn't I just do that so that this worked properly? Well, I tried, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. You see, this is my first ever VBA project, and perhaps a more experienced VBA dev would be able to make this work, but I couldn't figure it out. I know exactly what sequence of system calls are required, and I know what values to give them. The problem is just that these system calls have a more complicated set of arguments, and I don't really know VBA well enough to get all the right pointers to these arguments. In the end, I gave up and just went with the thing that kinda worked already. The other effect this had was that I couldn't escape the default config that programs use when they don't think they are connected to a terminal. In particular, bash echoes the characters it receives by default. The problem this causes for me is that Word is also adding the same characters to the document, so every letter typed appears twice. This is something that you can normally configure by setting a flag in the virtual terminal device. Since I had given up on getting that working, instead I had to work around this. So when bash is running, my terminal emulator deletes each character that Word adds to the document, so that only bash's echoed character remains. I think that's all the interesting parts of the terminal explained. If you have any other specific questions, then feel free to ask in the comments section below. If you like seeing weird computer stuff like this, you should subscribe so you hear about my next silly project.